2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul says to the young pastor named Timothy, he says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that the Word of God, Lord, the Bible is your Word to us. And so we pray now as we talk about this subject that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us to the truth of your Word and that you would draw us to yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, if you'll uh, look at this little business card here, so last week we had the, the bigger card stock for you, and I told you to put that somewhere, uh, like your fridge or somewhere where you could see it often and remember uh, these core values, and so we've got a little business card for you now, so you can put this in your wallet or your purse or your man purse, whatever, you know, uh, no judgment here, so uh, just put it wherever you have that you can keep and pull out and look at these core values, because these are so important, right? We're in week two now of studying our new five core values as a church, and we're covering these because we believe that this is what's going to keep us truly on the right path, on the right road, and what am I talking about? We're Well, we have this five-year vision that we believe God has given us as a church to pursue. It's called Kernan 2025. And so, in other words, we believe God is is shaping us into a people to honor Him and to love Him. And so, we want to pursue this vision over the next five years. But the the things that are going to keep us on the path, so to speak, what's really going to keep us on the right road and heading to that destination of becoming this church are these core values, these guardrails, so to speak. So by 2025 here at Kernan, we want to become a church that exists to make disciples who worship with authenticity, walk in community, and witness as we go, as we go out into this world and live for Christ. And so these guardrails, or these five core values, we believe will keep us in line with that vision and keep us on the right track So last week we looked at the first one, and it was we keep the gospel first. And so this means that above every other issue or topic that we could possibly talk about, we keep the gospel at the forefront of our thoughts, our attention, and our conversations. What Christ has done, that he died in our place And that he rose from the grave to give us salvation in his name by faith alone, through him, by his grace. That's the gospel message in a nutshell. And so we believe that that message is of first importance, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. It's not that other things aren't important, but the gospel is of first importance. So we keep the gospel first. But this week we're moving on to our second core value, our second statement, and that is we want to know what the Bible says and means. We want to know what the Bible says and means. Now, we're going to spend our rest of our time today talking about this, and I think the best way to approach this statement is by asking really three questions. And I want, I want, to, I want you to know this morning that we want this to be more than just a statement. We want this to be more than just something written on paper that looks nice and organized We want to live this out. We want this truth to be central to who we are as the people of God known as Kernan Church. And so we want to know what the Bible says and means. And so we're going to approach this today by asking three questions to really decipher and understand the depth of the meaning of that statement. So the first question is this. Why do we need to know what the Bible says and means? So it's always important to start with why. Why is this even important? You know, in today's secular modern American culture, there is an ongoing debate over whether or not there is such a thing as absolute truth. Right? Absolute truth. So modern secular philosophy 
is currently saying, and that you see this not just you know on TV, you see it in all kinds of pop culture, you see it being taught in the universities today, that no, there is no such thing as absolute truth, which that's ironic because that statement in and of itself is absolute, uh, so that's illogical. But people are saying, no, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Whatever makes you happy with your life, you pursue that, and that's what's true for you. Now, again, that is a logical fallacy, but that's the conventional wisdom of today's world. Whatever makes you happy, that's what's true for you. But you see, the Apostle Paul was very keen on this idea, and he understood the situation, and he warned Timothy about this kind of thinking. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, and I'll, you can read that along with me on the screen, Paul said this to Timothy, he said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And so I believe that's essentially what we see in our world today, just like it was happening there in the ancient world. People have swerved away from this idea of absolute truth. Our ultimate goal is to pursue our own desires, and it ends up with us wandering off into all kinds of what I would call myths. But as a Christian, as someone who claims to follow Jesus, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Creator of the world, we say, yes, there is absolute truth because there's a God. And this God is not just any kind of ancient pagan God. He's not a pagan God. He is the only one true God. He is the Creator. He has created the world and everything in it and so he has also established certain rules and laws in which he has designed this world to function and for humanity to flourish. So if there is such a thing as absolute truth from this creator God, then for you and I to have any real purpose or meaning in our lives in the time given that we have on this earth then we need to know what this Creator God, the holder and keeper of absolute truth, has said. Or has He said anything? So the question becomes, how do we discover and come to understand truth if it's even out there? And as Christians, we believe the answer to that question is by knowing what the Bible says and means. Because it is the words of God, spoken from our Creator. So, our God is a God who speaks, right? He created everything by speaking words. He literally spoke the world into existence. In Genesis 1-3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. He spoke the world into existence. But not only that, he also reveals himself by speaking. 2 Timothy 3.16, as we read earlier, says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. So these are his words. And just think about that. We have to understand the importance of realizing this. And I know we, most of us with a Christian worldview, like we, we kind of bring this assumption to the table but it is so important for us to really value this truth. The creator and keeper of all things true has spoken to us about that truth. Now how awesome is that? How awesome is it that he did not create the world and create us and then just turn it loose? Right? That's a very deistic view of God. That there's this greater deity that created us and then kind of let it go. No, he is intimately involved in this world because he has revealed himself to us. And he's done that through his written word. That's why the word of God, the Bible, is so powerful. It is the wit written and spoken words of our creator. So it's, it's not just some kind of guidebook or manual like the one in your car. 
that's always really difficult, right, to find what's wrong with your car in that car manual. It's like never seems to have explicitly what I should do when something's wrong. I'm not a car person, so, you know, I don't know. Maybe I need to look in the table of contents better. But I never can find it. That's not the Bible, though. It's not just some kind of guidebook or manual. It's not just good moral principles with, from some stories that happened a long time ago. We believe since it is the Word of God from His mouth that contains absolute truth, it is powerful and living. And so Hebrews 4.12 tells us exactly that. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I mean, think about that. Your Bible that you have a copy of that perhaps sits on your bookshelf or on your coffee table or beside your bed or with you now, wherever it is, it has the power to discern the thoughts and intentions of your heart by the Holy Spirit working through those words of God and planting them in your mind and in your heart. That is power. That is power, true power. So we believe the Bible is powerful because it has come from the mouth of God. So, so here at Kernan, I want us to go through several beliefs, particularly very specifically about the Bible, because here at Kernan, I want you to know we do have uh, some very specific beliefs about God's Word, uh, and these are all come from the Baptist Faith and Message, which is our statement of beliefs, our official document that we hold to. But I'll just go through these quickly. Number one, we believe the Bible is authoritative. Because God is the true author, we believe every word of the Bible is fully inspired, and so therefore it holds authority over us. We look to it as being our ultimate authority. 2 Timothy 3.16 again, right, that we've already read now more than once. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Number two, we believe the Bible is infallible. In other words, it is trustworthy and it will not fail. It will accomplish what God has sent it to do. Isaiah 55, 11 speaks of this. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The Bible will succeed for what God has purposed it to do. Number three, we believe the Bible is inerrant. In other words, it is without error. Proverbs 30, verse 5a says, every word of God proves true. It will prove to be true in the end. Number four, we believe the Bible is sufficient. The Bible provides every bit of wisdom we need for life. And that's what Paul was talking about there in 2 Timothy 16 and 17 of chapter 3 that we've already read, right? That is so good. Think about the sufficiency of Scripture in this verse. All Scriptures breathe out by God, and it's profitable, right? It, it, it's profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness to become more like Jesus, that the man of God may be what? Complete. Complete, equipped for every good work. Scripture is sufficient to equip us for the work God has called us to do. And then lastly, number five, we believe the Bible is eternal. We believe that its truth will endure forever. The Word of God will stand forever. First Peter, in uh, chapter 1, Peter said, The grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever. So these are just some, some basic truths that we believe here at Kernan about the Bible, about God's word. And so we're asking the question, why? Why do we need to know what the Bible says and means? Why do we need to take the Bible seriously? Because it's God's word. Because it does come from the mouth of God. Therefore, it does have authority over us. And it leads us to not just know what it says, but to live a life of godliness and holiness that obeys its commands and obeys the Lord 
and becomes more like Christ and loves God and grows in our love for each other and our love for the world. James 1, says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So why do we want to know what the Bible says and means? Because it is the spoken word of our creator. It contains all we need for life and godliness and to live out its truths. It is so important to know what the Bible says and means. But the second question I think we need to approach this statement with today is this. What does the Bible actually tell us? So we've talked about the why, why it's important, but now what does it actually say? Well, I think it tells us several things. You could kind of categorize this. Number one, it tells us who God is and his plan for redemption. It tells us about God. He reveals himself. Listen, I hate to break this bad news to you, but first and foremost, the Bible is not about you. It's not about you. It's, it wasn't written so that you could have a fuzzy moment in the morning with your coffee overlooking whatever your view is. <laughs> that's not what the Bible was written for. Now, that's an advantage and that's a perk, right? But first and foremost, the Bible is about God. It is about Jesus. He is the hero of this one grand narrative, this one grand story. Everything in the Old Testament points to the cross and the resurrection. Everything in the New Testament looks back at the cross and the resurrection. It is the focal point. That's why here at Kernan, our number one core value is we keep the gospel first, but we also want to know the greater story. We want to know from front to end what the Bible says and means so that we can understand the depths and the riches of his glory and grace. But the Bible's about God. And yes, we benefit from it, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it's full of passages teaching us about the character of God and what he's really like. For example, Isaiah 6, 3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So first and foremost, we know that God is a holy God. That's his primary characteristic is that he is holy. He is perfect. He is majestic. He is great. Of course, it's also full of passages about his plan for humanity and specifically his plan to redeem humanity and to bring people to an eternal home. One of the best passages of Scripture that kind of summarize the plan of redemption that the Bible is about is John 316, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the plan of redemption. That Christ has died for our sins in our place, the death we should have died. And he has risen from the grave to give us an eternal home forever with him. And by grace, through faith in his name, are we saved. By grace and faith alone are we saved. There's nothing we can do to earn his approval. We get the record of Christ in our place. Praise God. That's the gospel. And that's what the Bible's about. But the second thing the Bible tells us is who we are and our purpose in this world. It does speak to that very, very specifically and frequently. And it starts in the very beginning. In Genesis 1.27 it says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Now, we could do a whole sermon series basically on that one verse. But to summarize it, we were created to glorify God by reflecting his image to the world. That is our purpose as his people. And so the Bible is very clear about who we are. We are people created in the image of God, born to glorify him. Of course, we fail at this and we shatter the image inside of us by sinning and, and going against God's design for our lives. But praise God, that's the gospel. That's where the good news comes in. Jesus has, Jesus has died to save us and restore the image of God in us. Number three, the Bible tells us how to live in a broken world as citizens of heaven. It tells us how, as strangers and aliens, we live in this world that is hostile to this truth in particular, but absolute truth in general. So Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 5, 
You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. As followers of Jesus, the Bible teaches us how we bring healing salt to this broken world and how we shine the light of God's truth into the dark places of this world. The Bible is very clear on all of these things. So what does the Bible tell us? It tells us everything we need to know about God. It tells us everything we need to know about ourselves. And it tells us everything we need to know about the world and this context we're living in. So that's what the Bible tells us. So we've talked about the why. and We've talked about what it has to say. But I think the third question we need to ask this morning as we talk about how we want to know what the Bible says and means here at Kernan as the people of God What's the best way for us to find out what the Bible says and means? In other words, how do we go about this? How do we study the Word of God? How do we discover its truth? And how do we come to a deeper understanding of what it really means? You know, just to be frank with you, I think, I think one of the biggest problems among American Christians today is that many of us we just don't know. We don't know the Bible. We're biblically illiterate. The truth is, many Christians today, we just don't know what the Bible says or means. That's why you hear so many people in conversations, just, just in random, candid conversations, how often do you hear someone say, well, doesn't the Bible say... And like they're not sure, right? I mean, I don't know. Does it or not? It's because we don't know. We don't know what the Bible says. But Paul tells us we should be careful and intentional about how we approach the study of God's Word. Christians need to know what the Bible says and means. Now, I'm not saying, listen guys, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we have to become theological scholars and that you, we should all be equipped to teach a seminary class. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we need to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us. We need to be ready and equipped in this world to know what God has said and what is absolutely, actually true. And so Paul says we need to be careful then how we approach God's Word. We need to be very intentional in our study of God's Word and not approach it haphazardly or flippantly. And he tells Timothy, the young pastor, we need to handle this rightly, because if we don't, here's what could happen in the church. And I want to read this to you. This is very interesting. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 19, he's instructing Timothy, the young preacher. Paul's his mentor. He's telling, them, he's telling him the importance of, of keeping the Word of God, uh, tr handling it correctly. Here's what he says, verse 15. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, and what? Rightly handling the word of truth. So we don't, we don't approach this sacred text flippantly or casually without much thought or concern. We approach it very intentionally and carefully and thoughtfully. Because here's what can happen if you don't. Look at verse 16. He says, But avoid irreverent babble. Anybody out there just know someone that just babbles a lot? <laughs> avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Ooh, gross, right? <laughs> we don't want that. Among them, and I just think, I have to say, I just think that this is worth noting. Every time you see someone's name written in Scripture, okay, we've already talked about how the Bible is eternal, right? God's Word's going to last forever. I mean, how terrible is it that these two people's names are written in Scripture forever as causing problems in the church? Listen, you don't want to be that person, okay? So among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, poor souls. Here they are, right? Paul called them out. Hymenaeus and Philetus, and what have they done? They have swerved from the truth. Now, we're talking about guardrails that are going to keep us on the right path as we pursue our vision over the next five years as a church. Well, 
Hymenaeus and Philetus, they've done swerved off the road, right? They've done gone way out off the road, whatever, wherever they're going. They're, they've already surpassed the ditch. They're, they're cruising now, right? They have swerved from the truth. And what are they saying? Saying that the resurrection has already happened. Now, they're not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Most likely, they're talking about that some actual Christians have been raised from the grave uh, already. And so there was some, some stuff going on. And so Paul's saying, you know what? They're upsetting the faith of some because it's just irreverent babble and it's spreading like gangrene. So Hymenaeus and Philetus, you need to get your act together because you have swerved from the truth. You've wandered off into myths. But he says in verse 19, God's firm foundation stands. So we have to approach, the whole, the whole point of this is to say, we have to see the importance of approaching God's word carefully and thoughtfully and intentionally so that we are not guilty of swerving from the truth. Because that can happen and it can go wrong very quickly. This is how false teaching starts to spread and divide a church. We have to keep the gospel first. You remember the pyramid that I say I reference so often, right? Last week we talked about those top tier issues. Listen, we've got to agree on those. Now we don't have to agree on all those third level bottom issues, but we need to agree on what's most important. Because if we don't, this is what happens in a church. You're going to be the next Hymenaeus or Philetus, all right? I'm going to start calling people that. <laughs> Just kidding. So what's the best way, what's the best way then for us to find out what the Bible says and means? How do we practically do this together? To center our hearts and our minds on God's Word as our firm foundation that stands. Well, I think you can think of it in two ways. And both of these are vitally important. So we study God's Word by ourselves, right? So we need to do that. We need to discipline ourselves to study God's Word by ourselves, but also with others. So every follower of Jesus should be doing both. We need to study it alone and get right ourselves with God, but then we also need the encouragement and the wisdom and the guidance from other believers in our lives. We need both of those things happening simultaneously in proper rhythms of our weekly schedules, right? So every follower of Jesus should be doing intentional Bible study on their own time, and I want to kind of give you some just very practical tips for that on studying God's Word by yourself. First of all, I would say, if you haven't already, get a study Bible. A study Bible means it's, just, it's got the Word of God, it's got the Scripture, right? The ancient sacred text that we hold, but then it also has basically like footnotes, you know, sections underneath the Scriptures that explain a lot of the context, and so that's really helpful. So personally, I recommend the ESV study Bible or the NIV study Bible. Both, I use both of those myself, um, but there's other good ones out there, okay? But, but get a study Bible and I think that is so important because sometimes, you know, especially when you're reading something, it could be in the Old or New Testament, there's a particular, uh, you know, story happening or something's going on. And, and it's really foreign to our minds because some of these things that happened thousands of years ago don't still happen today. And so we need to understand the context if we really want to understand the depth of the truth of what God is saying, right? And those study Bibles help you with that. But now another daunting uh, thought is that a lot of people, okay, let's say you got your study Bible, you're, you're like, okay, I'm ready, I want to take this seriously, I want to know what the Bible says and means, but I think a lot of us, we don't really know where to begin, right? Anybody ever had that problem? I have. Now, I wouldn't suggest randomly opening up the Bible to any passage. I think you do need to be thoughtful. I mean, yes, you, any passage will speak to you, sure, the Holy Spirit will work through that, but I think it's really good to pick a particular book of the Bible, so like Matthew or Romans or Genesis, right? Pick a particular book of the Bible, and then I would encourage you, I would highly encourage you to get a commentary, a biblical commentary that's very readable and easy to understand, and that will help you so greatly in your personal Bible study. Um, I'll give you a recommendation of one I think is so good. Uh, there's, a, there's a commentary series called God's Word for You. God's Word for You. It's easy to, understand, easy to remember, right? God's Word for You. That's the name of the series, and they have published uh, different commentaries 
on many of the books of the Bible. Not every book yet. I think that's probably their end goal. But um, they're working on that. So I've got several of them in my office. You're welcome to come look at if you want an idea. But they're so good because what I love about those commentaries are it walks you through each verse one at a time. And as you're reading it, it kind of reads like a daily devotion. So you're learning the verse, but it's also very easy and readable and, and kind of like a devotional style. So it's not filled with the Greek and Hebrew and all that uh, textual stuff. It, it's, it's verse by verse, but it's very devotional. So anyways, I recommend those. Again, come see me if you're interested. I'll let you look at a, a few of mine. But my point is, every follower of Jesus, we should be so intentional and approach the Word of God carefully and with thought. And we need some help doing that. And those are some ways you can do it by yourself. But ultimately, you know what we need? We need each other to do that. And so I want to just express to you how important it is that we want to be a church driven by the Word of God. We want to be a church where we walk in community. In other words, we grow in our faith and we do that together. So how can you study God's Word here at Kernan? Well, we have several opportunities for you. Our primary way that we try to do this is through our community groups. Now, we're just now getting back to community groups, right? And they, even all of them haven't started back yet, and that's okay. We're getting there. But community groups is where we really want to see this walking in community happen, this learning about God together. Now, we need that. And, and, and think about this. Like, this is so easy, really, in a sense. I mean, you just have to show up and get involved with your group, right? And what a great way to set a weekly rhythm in your life, a weekly rhythm of, of learning about God's Word together. I think this is fascinating. It's such a great opportunity to do that. Another option that you have here at Kernan is our Wednesday night classes. We call those Kernan Equip. Currently, because of the coronavirus, we're not meeting on Wednesday nights, but when we resume, we're looking forward to starting these classes back and having these other opportunities for you to engage in God's Word with other believers, other Christians on a deeper level. And then, of course, we have the worship service, the preaching of God's Word, which is so important to, to be a part of every week. And then we have our next-gen ministry, our preschool, our kids, and our student ministries. And, you know, hey, I just want to say a word to the parents out there watching at home. I know many of you are, are not here because we don't have child care right now because of the coronavirus, but but I, I say this to you to encourage you. Please, please don't take it any other way, but this is to encourage our parents. I want us to think, and I'm speaking to myself here, like I want us to think about the time and the energy that we put into our children, our children getting a good education in math and science and history. And hey, that's great. We absolutely need that. But what if we as parents... As Christian parents, what, are, what if we were as concerned, just as much concerned about our children knowing the Word of God and knowing the Bible just as much as we were getting that education? In the long run, they need both, but which one is eternal? That's so important. Let's be a church that equips our parents to do just that. I want to close by saying, listen, I, I know this probably seems like a lot, <laughs> and I don't want to act like we're setting unrealistic expectations, but I do want to say this, here at Kernan, we want to raise the bar, because I think there are too many churches in America where the bar is too low. We need to know what God's Word says. We need to know what it means. And you know what ultimately this comes down to? Ultimately, this comes down to a question we need to ask all of ourselves in our hearts. How much do I really value what God has said? I mean, that's ultimately what this is about, right? How much do you really value what your Creator God has spoken? Do you believe this is worth your time? Do you believe studying the Bible intentionally by yourself and with others, do you believe that's worth your time? Do you believe it's worth your commitment? Our God is a God who speaks. And He has spoken. So will we be faithful? Will we be obedient to listen, 
to obey and grow in our love for him, for each other, and for our world.